Today's edition of Space Time is brought to you by our new sponsor, Brilliant.org. Maths and science done right. Learn to think like a scientist with their carefully curated lists of puzzles and questions. Check them out today and use the link Brilliant.org forward slash Stuart Gary so they know you've come from us. Once again, that's Brilliant.org forward slash Stuart Gary. This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 75. Coming up on Space Time... Australia finally set to establish its own space agency. Discovery of the nearest supermassive black hole binary system. And could fast radio bursts be common throughout the universe? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The Australian federal government has announced plans to establish its own space agency in an attempt to cash in on the growing $420 billion global space industry. The new agency will coordinate strategic long-term planning, supporting domestic aerospace industries currently worth over $4 billion annually, but which are often uncoordinated and fragmented, often developing similar competing systems. These ventures range from developing satellite technologies such as CubeSats, space laser systems and rocket propulsion systems including both hypersonic scramjet technology and printable aerospike rocket engines. The historic but long overdue decision follows a long and inglorious history of dithering and short-sightedness by successive governments on both sides of the political fence. Those immortal words of Australian politicians claiming there was no future in space have long exemplified the poor standard of scientific knowledge and understanding which for decades has been brought to the hallowed benches on both sides of the aisle of Parliament House and is still present today in the ongoing debate over climate change. The sad thing about all this is that the politicians have wasted so much time. Australia was once home to one of the world's largest spaceports at the Woomera rocket range north of Adelaide in outback South Australia. In fact, during the 1950s and 60s, Woomera was the second busiest rocket range in the world next to Cape Canaveral in Florida. Woomera was originally established as a joint Anglo-Australian launch complex in 1947, developing the Black Knight, Black Arrow and Blue Streak rockets. Black Knight was originally developed to test and verify the design of a re-entry vehicle for the Blue Streak. 22 Black Knight launches were carried out at Woomera between 1958 and 1965. The Blue Streak rocket eventually became the core stage of Europe's Europa launch vehicle, which was flown between 1964 and 1971. Seven of those launches took off from Woomera before the project was eventually moved to the new European Space Agency launch complex at Kourou in French Guiana. The Blue Streak and Black Knight were also to provide the basis for the first and second stages of what would be a new experimental satellite launch system known as Black Prince which would have been capable of launching 1,000 kilograms into a 740 kilometre high orbit. However, Black Prince was ultimately scrubbed in favour of European and American launches. Then there was the Black Arrow. It was a multi-stage rocket which was launched four times from Woomera between 1969 and 71, eventually launching Britain's Prospero satellite into orbit. Woomera also provided test facilities for numerous missile and weapon systems, including the Blue Streak nuclear standoff missile, the Seawolf, Rapier, Sea Dart and Bloodhound surface-to-air missiles, the Ikara anti-submarine missile, the Malkara anti-tank missile and the Jindavik remote-controlled aircraft. During 1966 and 67, a joint American, British and Australian program launched 10 Sparta three-stage rockets from Woomera on scientific test programs. The 22-metre-tall Sparta used an American liquid-fueled Redstone rocket for its first stage, an Antares II solid-fueled second stage, and a solid-fueled BE-3 third stage. The project was capped off on November 29, 1967, when Australia became only the third country in the world after the Soviet Union and the United States to launch a satellite into orbit from its own territory, when the RESAT spacecraft blasted off from Woomera Launch Complex 8 aboard a Sparta rocket. The nose cone-shaped RESAT satellite weighed just 45 kilograms and orbited the Earth some 642 times, sending back scientific data during its near-polar orbit before finally re-entering the atmosphere over the Atlantic Ocean on January 10, 1968. 
The Australian National Film and Sound Archive has this report on the development of the historic spacecraft. On the 29th of November 1967, Australia joined the Space Club of Nations by successfully launching from its own soil an Earth satellite of its own making. The project, which evolved from a program of upper atmosphere research that has continued over many years, was a joint effort of the Weapons Research Establishment and University of Adelaide. Design and manufacture of the satellite was conditioned by the short duration of the project, which, from acceptance to launching day, was only 11 months. The launching vehicle to be used was a US Sparta three-stage rocket, one of a series that had been fired at Woomera for research purposes. The satellite was so designed that both the third stage of the rocket and the instrumented nose cone would go into orbit together without separation. In all, three satellite cones were made. The first as a model for the structural design, the second as a space model to check the internal arrangement and accessibility of components, and the third as the actual flight model. The structure was of strong ring and stringer construction, braced by an aluminium outer skin 48 thousandths of an inch thick. Loads of up to 1,000 pounds were applied progressively at seven points on the structure to simulate the forces arising from acceleration. Over 70 strain gauges were used to measure the deformations produced. Drop tests were done to simulate the effects of acceleration with short rise time, such as might occur during launch or the firing of the upper stages. The design allowed for acceleration up to 40 G. Vibration tests were carried out on the flight cone. The cone was subjected to a spectrum of vibrations which would encompass all frequencies likely to be met with in flight. Measurements of accelerations in longitudinal and transverse directions were made on this centrifuge. The structural cone that was used included components and sub-assemblies. Extensive modifications to the WRE centrifuge and careful balancing adjustments were made prior to these tests. In these torsional impact tests, the shock forces achieved during the sudden braking simulated those that would be caused when the spin-up motors were fired. Tests were being made of the mechanism which ejected the protective plate covering the instruments that were exposed to solar radiations during flight. The plate was spun off by the centrifugal force arising from the rotation of the cone. And that report courtesy of the Australian National Film and Sound Archive. Australia is presently one of the only developed countries in the world without a dedicated space agency. A sad state of affairs as the Australian space industry employs around 12,000 people and has been growing by about 10% each year since the late 1990s. The federal government detailed its long-term plans for the proposed new space agency at the 68th International Astronautical Congress in Adelaide. A review into the local aerospace industry showed an overwhelming need for a national space agency. Acting Industry Minister Michaela Cash says the National Space Agency will ensure that the nation has a strategic long-term plan that supports the development and application of space technologies and grows the domestic space industry. The minister describes the proposed agency as an anchor for domestic coordination and the front door for international engagements. A reference group is now developing a charter for the agency with the results expected to be released in March next year. Jonathan Nally is the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And there's certainly no doubt that space technology and space services are vital to Australia, as they are to basically every other country, and there's a lot of money involved. Everything from whether it's the GPS in your phone or your car to the uh, communication satellites, the weather satellites, the satellites that monitor the ground for all sorts of reasons, whether it's mining or environmental reasons or bushfires, you name it. Uh, you know, there's Keeping billions on the neighbours. Keeping an eye on the neighbours. Yeah, yeah, military. There are billions and billions of dollars in, involved in it but you know most of the stuff that we spend that billion, those billions of dollars on belongs to someone else the satellite mostly with a few exceptions they generally belong to someone else and the data that's collected has been paid for by someone else and we um, sort of piggyback on along and, and do, do pay our share but the question is should we have a space agency do we need one what would it do this must be about the seventh or eighth inquiry governments have had into this very question there would be benefit to having some sort of space agency in Australia to at least coordinate things a bit and have a bit of a you know a national focus there are plenty of university departments plenty of companies doing their own thing and happily doing so that don't really need any help from anyone so I recall anecdotally you know from years ago where people from other countries people in you know big aerospace companies or even even space agencies or scientific agencies would be doing a ring around through the sort of mates network to say who do we talk to in the Australian government about space things we need to we need to talk to them about something but we just don't know who to call does anyone know 
know who we should call. So even if we had something like that, there have been space policy units and, and other things set up in the government, uh, and they've been doing their best with, you know, running on the smell of an oily rag, but there really hasn't been um, a focused effort out of the government in space technology for a very long time. As distinct from astronomy, astronomy in Australia has always done really well and has had, uh, you know, a, a very active scientific community that, um, and, and I've heard this said several times, that the, the government basically loves the Australian astronomers because the Australian astronomers don't fight amongst themselves and, and get into big arguments and, and you have half a dozen or ten different camps going to government and, and trying to compete to get dollars. The way it works is that the astronomers, um, uh, they produce produce plans every 10 years and they go to government and said look we've had the arguments amongst ourselves you know we don't all agree but at least we've, we've come up with a plan and here's our you know five point plan we voted and said these will be the priorities and how about it and the government just loves that because compared to other disciplines such as medicine or whatever where they've got different bodies coming at them left right and centre the astronomers generally just have the one body that goes to the government and said we've already had all our arguments we've already you know no one there's no not total agreement but this is what we've come up with what you think and the government just loves it. Of course all that's about to end now with the imminent demise of the Australian Astronomical Observatory and the, and the splitting up of all that for the various universities around the country. Well I wouldn't say it's about to end but it's, it's going to change. Yeah. There'll be some changes there but look when you when you look at the huge programs that are going in Australia with the square kilometre array and all sorts of other things you know Australian astronomy is doing really really well. Australian space technology and those sort of things haven't had the same sort of focus as say astronomy has and perhaps other disciplines and that's not a criticism of the people involved at all because there are fabulous people doing wonderful things but if you're going to have a, a national focus it needs it, it, it helps at least to have uh, governments who are sympathetic to the cause and think it's a good idea and unfortunately for the last 30, 40 years, there's just been really no interest out of any government at all when it comes to space things. You've been keeping a fairly close eye on uh, the space industry for the last 30 or 40 years. This has been your mm. passion, which is why we talk to you every month. Tell me, what's your own view? Australia has missed the boat when it comes to launching rockets and that kind of stuff, and I can't see it happening, unless there's some brand new technology that someone invents that takes over from standard rockets, which means Well, you we had the idea anywhere. of Christmas Island, that disappeared. We oh. had the idea of Cape York, that disappeared. There was even one near Darwin at one stage, wasn't there? That was planned. Yeah. That never happened either. Woomera nope, is nope. still there, but it's only a missile range now. Woomera is very... I've been to Woomera. I've been to Lake Hart. I've seen their huge launch pad. I guess you call them sarcophagi now almost because they're, they're sort of just a monument to the massive launch facilities that were built around Lake Hart to launch Black Knight and, and uh, Blue Streak and things like that. And mm. it's really sad when you look at those facilities and they were all scrapped and sold, I think it was to the Swedish for scrap metal, wasn't it? And it's so sad that they now got on. It happens. Look, um, Australia doesn't have a car manufacturing industry anymore. Um, you know, Actually, the, it still uh, does as of today. It won't this time next year, but it still does <laughs> as of today. Oh, well, that's all right then. As far as Australian space goes, I think um, a bit of support and enthusiasm from government would certainly help. And uh, But I don't know really whether we do need a formal space agency. It would, it would probably would be good just to have one, just as a, um, even just a figurehead to, uh, to keep things going along. But as I say, the, the whole sort of space ecosystem in Australia has learned to live without it. But if there were one, it would probably help. I don't see how it would uh, hinder our future with space technology. It would probably help. Andy Thomas, the uh, Australian astronaut, when I spoke to him, he uh, he told me how saddened he was that uh, we, we, we don't have a presence in space such as a uh, permanent presence on the International Space Station when we could have contributed something towards that. Yep, yep. Look, Canada has been involved from the word go and yep. uh, we could have been doing the same thing. We have turned down invitations from NASA to do this kind of thing over the decades. Uh, they, back in the 19th 70s. They said, look, do you want an Australian astronaut? You'll have to cough up some money for it, but uh, we'd love to have an Australian, uh, an official Australian astronaut program and, and send astronauts from Australia up into orbit. And the Aussies said, no thanks. Canada said, you beauty, we'll be involved in that. I don't know how the economics of it have stacked up, whether the all the investment in, in that has been worth. I think the technology transfer, as they call it, and the sort of spin-offs from that would have been absolutely fabulous. Um, and um, I think all power to the Canadians and other countries who've been involved, the Japanese, 
as well. Indians, Indians, way ahead. You know, yeah. so they're launching their own rockets. So, look, we've we missed the boat on some of these things, but we do have lots of good niches that we currently feel and can do more in, like the micro satellites and. Uh, Although the last and, CubeSat that went up that the Australians were involved with, I think that failed, didn't it? Well, it was an experimental sort of thing. The University of New South Wales was successfully deployed from the International Space Station, and the engineers are still working to try and make contact with it. Well, it, it's sad, but they're, they're experimental programs. You know, they're, um, they're they're giving it a go, and that, that's all right. I mean, that's fine. I mean, you haven't got a billion dollars down the drain. These are microsatellites. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's about the size of a loaf of bread. Yeah, very small, very yeah. small. And that's the way a lot of satellites are going these days, um, really miniaturised. University uh, of New South Wales, that's sort of the area they're focusing on now with their space research. That's right, that's right. So, look, there are niches like that that we can be involved in, and we are involved in. There are all sorts of little niches. Some of the big grand stuff, like astronauts and launching rockets, you know, you can forget that because other countries have got that sewn up. But you don't need that to be active in space programs. And what we have always been very, very good at is utilising the data that comes back from space, particularly the, say, weather satellites, the Earth monitoring satellites, where world leaders and all that sort of stuff. And that is worth a lot, a lot of money to us in the, the benefits it gives us, whether it's mining, as I say, or environmental monitoring. And there are exportable skills, and I'm sure we're training lots of people. So there, there are niches that we can fill. So the question again is, do we need a space agency to help this along? Well, as I say, everyone's learned to live without it, but it probably wouldn't hurt to have one. That's Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. <music> Astronomers have detected the nearest ever binary supermassive black hole system. The twin monsters, which are separated by only one light year, were located just 400 light years away in a spiral galaxy named NGC 7674. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, confirms that supermassive black holes over a million times the mass of the Sun, which are found at the centres of most, if not all, galaxies, can form gravitationally bound pairs when their host galaxies merge. One of the study's authors, Professor David Merritt from the Rochester Institute of Technology, says the newly discovered dual black hole system has the smallest separation of any so far detected through direct imaging. The combined mass of the two black holes is roughly 40 million times that of the Sun, and they have an orbital period around each other of about 100,000 years. Astronomers have already known that stellar mass black holes can and do collide and merge. Stellar mass black holes are formed out of the core collapse supernova explosions of stars far more massive than the Sun. It was a collision between two stellar mass black holes which led to the landmark discovery of gravitational waves in 2015 using the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO. The black holes in that merger were approximately 29 and 36 times the mass of the Sun and they collided some 1.3 billion light years away. However, Merritt says that a supermassive binary would generate gravitational waves at much lower frequencies than that of stellar mass black hole binaries. And so the signals from such a merger would still be undetectable by instruments such as LIGO. To discover their supermassive black hole binary, the authors used a method that employed radio telescopes around the world operating together as a single large radio telescope through a process called long baseline radio interferometry. This allowed them to achieve a resolution roughly 10 million times that of the angular resolution of the human eye. Using the very long baseline radio interferometry technique, two compact sources of radio emissions were detected at the centre of NGC 7674. The two radio sources had properties known to be associated with supermassive black holes accreting gas, implying the presence of two black holes. The galaxy hosting the binary supermassive black hole loudly emits radio waves, The detection confirmed the theory predicting the presence of compact binaries in radio galaxies bearing a characteristic Z-shape. The morphology is thought to result from the combined effect of the galaxy merger followed by the formation of the supermassive black hole binary. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. OK, let's take a break from the show and talk about our new sponsor, Brilliant.org. This is such a cool match between a sponsor and Space Time. People are always asking me about advice on how and where to learn more about astronomy and physics. And I can't emphasise enough how important it is to prioritise active problem solving, with things like lectures and readings serving as a supplement to that main goal of knowledge. And of course, space-time has always been designed to do both, provide news, while at the same time educating fans about the wonders of space sciences. 
But I think my greatest reward of all has come from those fans of space time, as well as its predecessor, Star Stuff, who are inspired to actively take a greater interest in science and astronomy. And that's where a sponsor like Brilliant.org comes in. It's one of those places you can go to on the net to learn more about science and about astronomy. The user experience is one of going through a very thoughtfully curated list of puzzles and questions. That's a lot of fun. A great exercise for your brain and a very productive way to expand your knowledge. I think anyone listening to Space Time would really enjoy checking out their astronomy course. As you explore through it, you'll get hooked on all sorts of really interesting things, like how the ancient Greeks first estimated the size of the sun. You can learn more about this approach in the Sizing of the Universe chapter. And if you follow the link, brilliant.org forward slash Stuart Gary, we'll put that in the show notes, it lets them know you came from here, and that way you'll be helping to support space time. That's brilliant.org forward slash Stuart Gary. And now it's back to the show. A new study claims mysterious nanosecond flashes of intense energy known as fast radio bursts or FRBs may be firing off every second. When fast radio bursts were first discovered by the Parkes Radio Telescope in 2001, astronomers had never seen anything like them before. Since then, just short of two dozen have been found, but scientists still have no idea what's causing these powerful bursts of radio emissions. Now, a report in the Astrophysical Journal Letters claims fast radio bursts could be continuously igniting every second or so somewhere over the entire observable universe. The study's lead author, Anastasia Falkov, from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, says if the high rate of fast radio burst emissions is correct, it means the sky's literally filled with flashes like paparazzi taking photos of celebrities. However, instead of being invisible light, these flashes come in radio waves. To make their estimates, Falkov and co-author Avi Loeb, also from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, assume that FRB 121102, a fast radio burst located in a galaxy about 3 billion light-years away, is fairly representative of all fast radio bursts. Of course, they didn't have much choice. You see, this particular fast radio burst is the only one that's ever produced repeated signals since its discovery in 2002. Therefore, astronomers have been able to study it in much more detail than other fast radio bursts, which briefly light up the sky and then disappear forever. In fact, prior to this specific FRB discovery, astronomers had hypothesized that fast radio bursts were being caused by some sort of cataclysmic event, such as the destruction of a star in a supernova explosion. However, the detection of FRB 121102 near the center of a galaxy is pointing more towards a possible black hole event. Using that information, the authors projected how many FRBs would exist across the entire sky. Avi Loeb says in the same time it takes to drink a cup of coffee, hundreds of FRBs may have gone off somewhere in the universe. And if astronomers can study even a fraction of those well enough, they should be able to unravel their origins. While their exact nature is still unknown, most scientists think fast radio bursts originate in galaxies billions of light years away. Apart from supermassive black holes, one leading idea is that fast radio bursts could be byproducts from young, rapidly spinning neutron stars with extraordinarily strong magnetic fields. But even if scientists never fully understand what fast radio bursts are, they're still useful because they could be used to study the structure and evolution of the universe. You see, a large population of faraway FRBs could act as probes of material across galactic distances. This intervening material blurs the signal from the cosmic microwave background, the leftover radiation from the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, now cooled to just 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. A careful study of this intervening material should give improved understanding of basic cosmic constituents, such as the relative amounts of ordinary matter, dark matter and dark energy, which affect how rapidly the universe is expanding. FRBs could also be used to trace what broke down the fog of hydrogen atoms which pervaded the early universe into free electrons and protons once temperatures had cooled down enough after the Big Bang. You see, it's generally thought that ultraviolet light from the very first stars to shine ionized the hydrogen gas, clearing the fog and allowing photons to escape. Studying very distant FRBs will allow scientists to study where, when and how this process of reionization occurred. This would allow scientists to study the dawn of the universe in a new way. 
The authors also examined how successful new radio telescopes, both those already in operation and those planned for the future, may be at discovering large numbers of FRBs. For example, the Square Kilometre Array, now being developed in Australia and South Africa, will be a powerful new tool for detecting fast radio bursts. A new study suggests that over the entire sky, the Square Kilometre Array may be able to detect more than one FRB per minute, which originated from the time when reionisation occurred, some 400 million years after the Big Bang. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. In case you missed it, the end of the world was supposed to have taken place last Saturday, September the 23rd. At least it was according to Christian theorist David Mead. But it looks like he was wrong, and consequently so too are all the sheeple who believed him. Mead was claiming that an apocalyptic hypothetical planet called Nibiru would collide with the Earth, destroying all life. Mead claims that Nibiru was mentioned in the Bible as the star Wormwood, which falls from the sky. He claimed Revelation 8.10 states that the third angel blew his trumpet and a giant star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water, and the name of the star was Wormwood. Trouble is, there is no star called Wormwood, nor is there a brown dwarf called Wormwood, nor is there a planet, asteroid or comet called Wormwood. Still, Mead said it was proof Nibiru was on its way to Earth to cause the apocalypse, which according to him actually began on August the 21st when the famous American solar eclipse swept across the United States. According to Mead, another sign supporting his prognostications was found in Revelations 12.1, which states that a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars upon her head, and being with child she cried out and was in anguish of delivery. Mead said he was sure the woman in the sky referred to the sun's position on September the 23rd in the constellation Virgo, Latin for virgin, which according to Mead could only mean the Virgin Mary. Mead's failure to accurately predict Armageddon adds to an already bulging list of thousands of astrologers, fortune tellers, soothsayers and religious believers. Remember Jim Jones in the People's Temple? What about Marshall Applewhite and the Heaven's Gate cult? In fact, any Google search will come up with the names of literally thousands of crackpots who have foretold the end of the world, providing positive proof that a sucker really is born every minute. Of course, there are some more scientifically based hypotheses which could or in some cases definitely will see the destruction of life on Earth. For example, the Earth gets hit by a large asteroid or comet big enough to trigger a mass extinction event roughly every 60 million years or so, based on past geologic history. The last big one was 66 million years ago, when an asteroid about 10 kilometres wide slammed into the planet, causing the KPG mass extinction event, which wiped out over 75% of all life on Earth, including all the non-avian dinosaurs. And based on that 60 million year past history count, we're already well overdue for the next big one. Another likely event which could damage if not destroy life on Earth would be a nearby supernova explosion. In fact, it was a nearby supernova which triggered the birth of our Sun and solar system 4.6 billion years ago, and it's reasonable to expect another one could well end it. The best candidate for a nearby supernova explosion would be the wolf rayet star WR104, which is part of a triple star system located just 7,500 light years away in the Pinwheel Nebula. The rotational axis of the system, and likely the two closest stars in the system, is aimed close to, if not directly, towards the Earth. Within the next 300,000 years, the wolf rayet star is expected to undergo a core collapse supernova event, which could also generate a long-duration gamma-ray burst, and that too would have a catastrophic effect were it to hit the Earth. Mind you, the wolf rayet star's companion, an OB main-sequence blue star, will also eventually go supernova, but it's the wolf rayet star which is likely to go supernova first. Wolf rayet stars with a sufficiently high spin velocity prior to going supernova could produce long-duration gamma-ray bursts from two oppositely directed relativistic jets beaming out high-energy radiation along the star's rotational axis. However, so far, gamma-ray bursts have been almost exclusively associated with early galaxies in the distant universe, which are full of stars with far lower metallicities than what's been observed here in the Milky Way galaxy. But even if there isn't a gamma-ray burst, the supernova events are still likely to happen. And that's why knowing the inclination of the rotation of the stars are important, because that lets us know if they're pointing towards us. 
As far as we can tell, the inclination of the binary system containing WR104 is roughly 12 degrees relative to line of sight. And assuming both stars have their rotational axis similarly oriented, it does suggest a potential risk to the Earth within the next 300,000 years when one of these stars explodes. So let's drill down into this a little bit more deeply. Our best observations are consistent with an orbital pole angle for each of these stars of somewhere from 0 to 16 degrees relative to the Earth, with 12 degrees being the best guess. However, spectroscopic observations have suggested a slightly larger and therefore less dangerous angle of somewhere between 30 and 45 degrees from a direct interception with the Earth. Still, if it does occur and these jets do just happen to be pointed towards the Earth, its consequences would significantly harm life on Earth. But the true impact would depend on the amount of radiation received, the number of energetic particles and the distance to the progenitor star. Any supernovae occurring within 6,500 light years of the Earth would be close enough to impact the Earth's ozone layer, potentially triggering a mass extinction. In fact, it's thought just such an event triggered the Ordovician Silurian mass extinction event 455 million years ago. Well, if asteroid impacts and supernovae don't rock your boat in terms of destruction of the planet, how about a prediction by the Geographical Society, which shows past evidence that indicates the Earth will undergo a supervolcanic eruption large enough to produce over 3,200 cubic kilometres of magma sometime within the next million years. An event such as that would be comparable to the Toba super eruption 75,000 years ago in Indonesia. In case you were wondering, the Toba eruption reduced Earth's population of humans to just 2,000 breeding pairs. And if all that's still a little bit too iffy, let's get down to some hard, indisputable facts. In about a billion years from now, the Sun's current stable phase of shining will come to an end. Eventually, it'll begin brightening significantly, becoming far too hot for life on Earth to exist. This will begin the process of the Sun leaving the main sequence, where it's fusing hydrogen to helium in its core, and becoming what's known as a red giant. In about 5 billion years from now, the Sun's outer atmosphere will have expanded sufficiently to swallow up Mercury, Venus, and most likely the Earth as well. And even if the Earth does escape, its future will still be sealed in about 7.59 billion years' time as the Earth and the Moon are destroyed as they fall into the Sun just before our local star reaches the tip of its red giant phase, expanding out to some 256 times its present radius. Just before this final, ultimate collision, the Moon, which has been slowly moving away from the Earth at about 3 centimetres per year ever since it formed 4.6 billion years ago, will slowly start to spiral back towards the Earth as the Earth moves towards the Sun. In the process, the Moon will pass within the Earth's Roche limit. Luna will then break up into a ring of debris, which will rain down as fiery chunks upon the Earth's already molten surface. And Armageddon doesn't end there. In about 22 billion years from now, the universe will be destroyed if the Big Rip scenario is correct, as the cosmos rips itself apart at the subatomic level under the forces of dark energy. However, that may not happen. You see, the other dark energy model, known as the Big Freeze, indicates the universe is more likely to undergo an ultimate heat death. All the galaxies will have moved away from each other, all the stars in those galaxies will have burnt out, leaving nothing but black holes to dominate the empty skies. But even those black holes will die as they eventually evaporate away, leaving only isolated elemental particles, separated by far too much distance to ever contact each other. Our once spectacular universe will be a cold, dark, empty place with no thermodynamic free energy, resulting in a lack of sustained directed motion. This ultimate fate of the universe, the ultimate Armageddon, is likely to occur in about 10 duo trillion trillion years from now. And yes, 10 duo trillion trillion years is a real number. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. And the largest study ever undertaken of the human microbiome, the trillions of microbial organisms that live on and within human bodies, has uncovered millions of previously unknown genes from microbial communities in the human gut, skin, mouth and vaginal microbiome. The discovery, reported in the journal Nature, provides new insights into the roles these microbes play in human health and disease. 
The study is part of a project launched back in 2008 to identify and characterize human microbes, explore microbes' relationship to human health and disease, and develop computational tools to analyze the microbes. The microbiome has been linked to various aspects of human health, including the robustness of the human immune system and human susceptibility to chronic diseases such as Crohn's disease and cancer. For the study, researchers analysed some 1,635 new microbiome samples for a total of 2,355 sampled from 265 people. Scientists use DNA sequence analysis tools to identify which organisms are present in various body sites, determine whether they change or stay relatively stable over time, and explore their function. The studies also provided one of the largest profiles of the non-bacterial members of the microbiome, namely viruses and fungi. Iran has tested its new nuclear-capable Karam Hashar ballistic missile. The launch marks the latest violation of Tehran's weapons ban agreement under UN Resolution 2231. The new Karam Shahar ballistic missile was developed with the aid of close Iranian ally North Korea. The multi-stage missile has a range of over 2,000 kilometres and is capable of carrying at least 1,800 kilograms of multiple warheads, including conventional weapons such as cluster bombs, as well as potentially thermonuclear warheads. The test came in response to sharp criticism of the United Nations over the revolutionary Islamic Republic's ongoing financial support of global terrorism, including both the Palestinian Hamas and Lebanese Hezbollah terrorist groups, as well as terrorist operations in Yemen and in support of the brutal Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. US President Donald Trump told the United Nations General Assembly last week that Iran was a rogue state whose chief exports were violence, bloodshed and chaos. The criticism came as Iran continues to build up its missile capabilities. The president also criticised Iran's 2015 agreement with the Obama administration and other world powers in which Tehran agreed to restrict its nuclear program in return for relief from economic sanctions. The all-rich nation has always claimed its nuclear program was for peaceful electricity generation only. However, Iran couldn't explain why it was purifying its uranium reserves to weapons grade. A new study claims a diet that includes plenty of colourful vegetables and fruits may contain compounds that can stop colon cancer and inflammatory bowel diseases. The findings, reported in the Journal of Nutritional Biochemistry, provide scientists with new clues about how compounds in this produce work on a molecular level, an initial step towards finding new treatments for cancer. In the study, pigs served a high-calorie diet supplemented with purple-fleshed potatoes had less chronic mucosal interleukin-6 compared to a control group. Interleukin-6 is a protein important in inflammation, and elevated levels are correlated with proteins such as Ki67 that are linked to the spread and growth of cancer cells. According to researchers, eating whole foods that contain macronutrients, they're substances that humans need in large amounts such as proteins, as well as micro- and phytonutrients such as vitamins, carotenoids and flavonoids, may be effective in altering the interleukin-6 pathway. The findings reinforce recent research suggesting cultures with plant-based diets tend to have lower colon cancer rates than cultures with meat-based diets. Colon cancer is a leading killer in many Western societies, which tend to include a diet of more meat and less fruit and vegetables. While the researchers relied on purple potatoes for their study, other colourful fruits and vegetables could prompt similar effects. That's because colourful plants, including purple potatoes, contain bioactive compounds such as anthocyanins and phenolic acids that have been linked to cancer prevention. Exceptionally well-preserved trilobite fossils from China dating back over 500 million years have shown paleontologists that at least two trilobite species evolved stomach structures some 20 million years earlier than previously thought. The discovery, reported in the journal PLOS One, has revealed new insights into the extinct marine animal's digestive system. Trilobites are a group of extinct marine arthropods distantly related to horseshoe crabs that lived for almost 300 million years. They were an extremely diverse group of animals with some 20,000 species and their fossil exoskeletons can be found all around the world. Trilobites are one of the first types of animals to have shown up in large numbers in the fossil records. Their exoskeletons were heavy in minerals allowing them to preserve really well. But it's very rare to see the preservation of soft tissues like organs or appendages in trilobites. Previous research has suggested that there were two basic body plans for trilobite digestive systems. The simplest was just a tube that ran down the length of the trilobite's body with lateral digestive glands that would help process food. The other was a primitive expanded stomach called a crop, leading to a single tube with no lateral glands. Until now, only the first type had been reported from the oldest trilobites. 
Based on this, researchers had always proposed that the evolution of the crop must have come later in trilobite evolution and represented a distinct type of digestive system. The Chinese trilobite fossils, about 20% of which have soft tissue preservation, are dated to the early Cambrian, about 514 million years ago. And finally for now, a new study has looked at sexual relationships in the 21st century. The study, reported in the journal Deutsches Arztblatt International, surveyed some 2,524 people about their sexual practices and relationships. They found that 13% of survey participants have reported having had unprotected sexual intercourse outside their primary relationship, and only 2% reported always using condoms. The authors also found that only one in four people who reported having unprotected sex outside their primary relationship admitted to having had a medical checkup afterwards for possible STDs just in case. The study found 82% of women and 86% of men described themselves as being exclusively heterosexual. 57% reported they were in a stable relationship, although only 40% of those in stable relationships were in monogamous relationships. 2% had open relationships and 1% reported having threesomes. Of the women of reproductive age, that is those under 50, 51% reported they were taking oral contraception. 17% used other kinds of contraception. 5% weren't using contraception as they wanted to have kids. 27% didn't think about contraception. And 7% of women had taken interceptives such as the morning after pill for the purpose of postcoital contraception. And 3% had taken such drugs more than once. 21% of men and 15% of women admitted to having had sexual partners outside their relationships. Those who had had an external sexual encounter reported an average of 3.65 other partners in addition to their primary partner. 8% of men reported having had sex with an average of four female prostitutes. That's Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast -coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. This episode of Space Time has been brought to you by Brilliant.org, maths and science done right. And remember to use our special link so they know you've come from us. That's Brilliant.org forward slash Stuart Gary.